welcome to this panel. Filtering away infringements, three words that capture the essence of our debate uh, this morning. And as the title suggests, um, this is a very controversial topic. Um, it's also become uh, more and more urgent now that the technological development we already show, saw some science fiction that's becoming fact earlier this morning, now that technological development has actually made internet filtering a viable or at least close to viable option, something that was not the case when this discussion started more theoretically some 10 or maybe more years ago. And it's actually happening on online platforms to some, to a large extent, like YouTube. Can we, uh, should we, expect from internet service providers, from other intermediaries, that copyright infringing content be filtered out? In Europe, the safe harbors that the e-commerce directive uh, provides offer immunity only against, as we all know, liability for monetary damages. They are basically silent on the issue of injunctions. Nevertheless, the European Court has on several occasions set certain limits to the freedom of national courts to impose filtering or blocking injunctions against ISPs, but still many important questions, the most important questions remain. So the main question for this panel is what kind of preventive measures can be reasonably imposed upon intermediaries in the light of the needs of proportionality of copyright enforcement, fundamental freedoms, the state of technology. And the underlying key question, can technology solve this problem? And if so, should technology solve this problem is also there between the lines. We have a stellar panel sitting in front of you to confront these very difficult questions. And I will briefly introduce them. They all have enormous CVs, but we'll keep it short. Dirk Fischer is a leading expert of intellectual property law, particularly copyright law, but he, he knows everything. In the Netherlands, he's a professor of IP law in Leiden, co-author of the most authoritative treaty on Dutch copyright, partner and lawyer at Klos Morel, Vos en Schaap, Advocaten here in Amsterdam, and he has on many occasions represented right holders in online copyright infringement cases, but he also occasionally works for the other side. Um, Remy Chavan is the uh, partner at uh, Brinkhoff Advocaten Amsterdam, um, one of the leading lawyers uh, in the Netherlands in the field of media, telecommunications, and internet regulation. Remy regularly represents broadband providers in cases of copyright infringement and defamation and many other cases. Um, in the middle of our panel we have, and this is not by accident, our judge, the Honorable Mr. Justice Richard Arnold, judge of the High Court of Justice in the United Kingdom, Chancery Division, um, I think we can now easily say the most prominent British magistrate in the field of copyright, intellectual property. Generally, he has also, amongst many other important things, uh, issued several influential references to the European Court of Justice. Um, next to uh, Richard Arnold, we have uh, Fred von Lohmann who will be speaking to you later as a keynote speaker. He is the senior copyright counsel at Google. He's also a brilliant lecturer, as his keynote speech surely will demonstrate, putting some pressure on you here, Fred. And he's also on the faculty of EFIR's annual summer course on international copyright law that happens next week. Something to consider maybe next year for you. Um, Next to Fred, we have Reto Hilti, who is the director of the famous Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition. You might know this formally as the Max Planck Institute for Intellectual Property, but we're not allowed to say that anymore. Um, the powerhouse of IP scholarship in Munich. Uh, I'm sure you've all been there once, if, if only to plunder its fabulous library. 
Um, he's also a professor at the University of Zurich. He's an honorary professor at the University of Munich. He's an honorary professor at almost all universities in China as well. Um, and he's a big name in IP. Um, Niva, at the very end of the table, Niva Elkin Corin is our uh, is, is um, the final member on this panel. She is the founding director of the Haifa Center for Law and Technology at uh, uh, Haifa University. And she's also, and she's been that for, until quite recently, the, the, the former dean of the University of Haifa Faculty of Law. And Niva, as we all know, is also a leading international scholar in the field of copyright and information law generally. By the way, she's also, and I re still I remember that, one of the very first to actually publish on the issue of liability of intermediaries. Wasn't that in the last century? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still one of Nifa's many research topics. By the way, all of the panelists are also very good friends of Evir. Um, and thank you for being on this panel. Um, a bit about the format. The format is inspired by a court proceedings, which is in turn inspired by our judges present here, actually. We will kick off with a mini debate between our lawyers, Dirk and Remy, each taking oppos opposing positions on the issue. And note that we have actually asked them to take diametrically opposed positions in this case. Note also that what they're going to say is not necessarily what they would write in scholarship uh, 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 environment. Um, this is a dialectical approach that we think fosters the debate. I think that's enough of a disclaimer, right? Um, after this mini debate, our judge will have the opportunity of asking Dirk and Remy one or two questions. Next, the floor will be to our expert witnesses, Niva, Reto, and Fred. Thereafter, we would like to involve you, the audience, in our debate, and the panelists may have some questions for each other as well. Finally, at the very end, we will ask our judge, Richard Arnold, to give his verdict. So that's an exciting format, and I now invite uh, Dirk to take, to do the first oral argument. Dirk. Thank you very much, Bernd. Ladies and gentlemen, copyright is just a way to create a market for information. That is what Paul Goldstein reminded us of last year when he came over together with Jamie Boyle to tell us about copyright. And it is not unimportant to, to reiterate that. Um, creators get temporary monopolies which enable them to ask a price for the enjoyment of their works. Consumers can decide whether they want to enjoy the work and pay the price. Both benefit. Creators can make a living by creating new works and consumers can enjoy new works. And the preference of the consumers and their willingness to pay a price determine what works get paid. So. So far, no one has come up with a more efficient system to regulate the creation of information. The copyright market for information can, however, not function if there is a black market at which stolen works are given away for free. If we are not able to stop this black market, or at least limit its impact, the legitimate market for information created by copyright for the common good is going to fail. The best way to stop a black market is not to buy or sell on it. But many people cannot resist the temptation. Especially when the black market offers stuff A, for free, and B, stuff that is not yet available on the legitimate market or not available for a reasonable price. Going after the individual sellers on this black market is very hard because most illegal uploaders hide 
behind anonymity. And the same goes for individual buyers on that market. Going after individual downloaders also turns out to be either impossible or undesirable for privacy reasons. It is impossible or undesirable to go after individual uploaders or downloaders. So the conclusion is very easy. We can only turn to the intermediaries whose services are used by a third party to infringe copyright. There is simply no other option if we still want to enforce copyright. Those online intermediaries have a moral and a legal responsibility to try to stop infringements. That is, for instance, laid down in Article 8.3 of the Copyright Directive. As far as online intermediaries are concerned, there are two kinds. There is the bad faith kind, they're called the Pirate Bay, Mininova, Mega Upload or Kino.to. They know that they are encouraging piracy, and in fact their whole business model depends on it. They facilitate and encourage illegal uploading and downloading, and we can simply refer to them as the bad guys. And the moment I wrote that down, I thought that was something that would be acceptable to the audience, but I didn't realize that I was in, going to be in the temple of the high priests of privacy and, and free speech. So probably you don't see them as the bad guys, and you think, in fact, that the right owners are the bad guys. So we have a problem of framing and labeling here, I suppose. But I think most of you would agree that still those purely illegal business models should be banned. But that turns out to be very hard because they hide and they move around from country to country. But one way or another they have to be stopped. And also important, they have to be seen to be stopped. And blocking them might be one of the options. On the other hand, there are the good faith intermediaries. They are called, called Google, eBay, UPC, British Telecom, and LeaseWeb. They do not intentionally encourage piracy, but they risk facilitating it. And they can be making money out of it. And the fact that they are facilitating it, and they are making money out of it, that brings a legal and a moral responsibility to do something about it. If they want to be considered good faith online intermediaries, they have to act responsibly. They have to do what can be reasonably expected of them to avoid facilitating piracy. We can refer to them as the reasonable guys. And even that might be a controversial statement regarding Google and eBay and, and, and Facebook, but still, they are not intentionally in the business of creating a black market for pirated goods. What can be reasonably expected of the reasonable guys? We all know by now that a notice and takedown system is not enough. Due to the slowness of such a system and the speed with which new illegal uploads take place, it does not suffice. There needs to be a, be a notice and stay down requirement. A notice and stay down requirement requires some kind of recognition system. Illegal websites, illegal files have to be identified and recognized in order to keep them out. It may be necessary to require good faith intermediaries to implement some kind of filtering system to avoid illegal files which have been taken down to be uploaded again. It may also be required for them to block certain websites, domain names, or IP addresses after it has been established that these are clearly bad websites. As far as terrorism, child pornography, and computer viruses are concerned, the reasonable guys have no problem with blocking and filtering. In fact, they do it all the time. They just do not talk about it that much. But as soon as filtering or blocking is mentioned in connection with copyright, many believers in the free and open internet, and probably the majority here, get very excited. A well-respected retired professor of information law wrote, filteren is gewoon censuur en daarmee basta. Filtering is simply censorship and that's final. We're not even allowed to question it. So much for an academic attitude towards the problem. 
But of course, it is about fundamental rights. Which fundamental rights are we talking about? Not about privacy. There is no right to anonymously infringe copyright. And every commercial entity, at least within the European Union, has the obligation to disclose his real identity and a genuine address. That is in Article 5.1 of the e-commerce directive. That's a clause that's often overlooked, but all those websites are quite illegal, not just because they trade illegal goods, because they don't identify themselves. They trade on the net and they don't identify themselves. And that's a clear violation of Article 5.1 of the e-commerce directive. So privacy is not really an issue here. Free speech, always a favorite. Well, possibly. Of course, it would not be right to filter out the title of a recent movie out of a discussion platform where people only discuss those movies. But what if it turns out that this discussion platform is just a disguise for another black market place for illegal uploads and does in fact contain a list of the most popular illegal sources where you can download the most recent movies? Then it would not be so unreasonable to require the owner of such a web website to filter out those titles. And then there is the new kid on the block, the fundamental right to conduct a business. I love that very much. It's Article 16 of the Charter, and it is just, of course, a countervailing argument against making unreasonable demands of people. There is indeed this freedom to conduct a multi-million business. Obviously, we're talking about big business here. But of course, within reason, within the rule of law. Obviously, no unbearable sacrifices, a fair balance has to be struck. And mostly, it is of course about costs. Intermediaries do not really care about, and I have to be very careful, uh, intermediaries do not really care about free speech, except for PR reasons. Then there is the famous argument of overblocking and underblocking. Underblocking, that blocking is not effective enough, that you don't block everything. That's an often used argument. That's not really an argument. The risk of underblocking is only relevant in connection with costs involved. Underblocking in itself is harmless and not a very convincing argument against filtering. Surveillance cameras in shops do not stop shoplifting altogether, so they are under-blocking. But very few people nowadays, maybe in this room, but out there, very few people nowadays suggest that surveillance cameras are illegal, and certainly not because they're not effective enough. Then there is the famous over-blocking argument, and that's an often abused argument. If a website is called the Pirate Bay and has been banned by several courts, in fact, by, by tens of courts, I think, uh, Argentina was the last one last week, um, for offering 99% copyright infringing material. If that is the case, the risk of also filtering out the exchange of recipes for apple pie or harmless joke is a bit far-fetched. But as you know, that was the argument that in the Netherlands, Kaza won out eventually because um, the court was still so naive to believe that exchanging jokes was the main purpose of peer-to-peer -peer platforms. That is some time ago, but it really happened. And because of the cassation system, the Dutch Supreme Court couldn't do anything about it, but so Kaza was not illegal because it was mainly there to exchange jokes and recipes for apple pie. If intermediaries intentionally allow bad guys, again, what I call bad guys, and what you probably call, call uh, freedom fighters, to share internet addresses with harmless people. No, I have to say this again because it's really important. If intermediaries intentionally allow bad guys to share internet addresses with harmless people with a legitimate business. So if you would say um, a grocer shop has the same IP address as the Pirate Bay. And therefore, we have this giant overblocking problem because all of a sudden this legitimate grocer cannot be reached because the whole IP number has been blocked. Then, in my opinion, it's those intermediaries that allow that to happen who are to be blamed if overblocking takes place. It is 
like allowing the use of civilian hostages in battle or the use of an ambulance to transport fighting troops. That's a nice one, isn't it? I like it myself very much. <laughs> um, then about costs. It is, in the end, all about costs. In the Netherlands, we had a case about uh, an eBay uh, subsidiary who um, had or had not to filter out uh, illegal copies of children's chairs. And in the end, it was all about the costs. Um, eBay didn't have to do that because there was a reasonable solution where, uh, where Marktplatz could do it at its own cost. It's, it's all about costs. And of course, the costs have been to be divided in a reasonable way. Right owners have to provide the identification material, the fingerprinting, or the list of titles. And intermediaries have to do the blocking. Reasonable intermediaries should take all reasonable measures. As soon as the filtering reference material is available, if you know what you have to filter, then of course it's a fully automated system and the costs are neg negligible. I come to a conclusion. Of course, blocking and filtering is not a panacea. But bad websites have to be seen to be stopped. A situation where all courts in the world have already said that the Pirate Bay is illegal, but it's still out there. If I just go to the website, especially in the Netherlands because it's no longer blocked, then it's, there is no mention whatsoever of what's happening there is illegal and immoral. You can't see it. It has to be banned by the courts, but there's no consequence to it. And that is plainly wrong. After an impartial court in a democracy has decided that the website such as the Pirate Bay or Keynote.to is illegal and should be closed down, good faith intermediaries have a legal and a moral obligation to try to stop or limit the access to these websites, just as they do with terrorism, child pornography and computer viruses. If a court order is not seen to have any consequences, then anarchy is around the corner. Of course, copyright piracy will not disappear. It will move to the dark net, or whatever the latest obscure corner of the internet is called, just as child pornography does. But that makes it at least less available for the average internet user, who has to be well aware that illegal sources are illegal. The public should not be led to believe that buying on the black market is okay. The black market is not okay. Thank you. Good morning. Um, first of all, thanks very much to Bernd and the IFA for inviting me. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, I suppose I must compliment Professor Visser for making the case for blocking and filtering about as persuasively as it can be made. He almost makes, managed, managed to make it sound reasonable. Now, how does he do this? Well, he does it by using the word reasonable quite a lot. So he says reasonable intermediaries have a moral duty to do what can be reasonably expected of them. It's a very Dutch approach, isn't it? It combines sort of uh, mercantile pragmatism with the preacher's raised finger. <laughs> Who could possibly disagree? But reasonable as it sounds, it doesn't actually help us very much when it comes to figuring out what exactly those reasonable intermediaries should reasonably be doing. So rhetoric aside, reasonableness is neither technically nor legally very useful. And you may have noticed that Professor Visser's speech was a little light on both. So if his use of the word reasonable is helpful, it's by illustrating that a fair balance has to be struck between competing rights and interests. But this is where his analysis lacks focus. He conflates various kinds of intermediaries various kinds of bad websites, and various kinds of measures. A torrent sharing platform is not a general search engine, is not a hosting provider, is not an access provider. And what can reasonably be expected of each of these types of intermediaries is very different. Similarly, forcing an access provider to, to block a single foreign site is a very different kind of measure from ordering an access provider to filter out all infringing contents from its traffic. In terms of how difficult and expensive it is to implement, how effective it is at addressing the supposed problem, and how much collateral damage it, uh, it inflicts on the fundamental rights of others. So we do need to dig a little bit deeper. Mr. Visser has rightly mentioned the four competing fundamental rights, but he argues that 
neither freedom uh, of information nor privacy are really at stake, and that the only real requirement is to strike a fair balance between copyright enforcement and the ISP's freedom to conduct a business. So in the end, it just boils down to finding a reasonable compromise between the right holder and the ISP. It shouldn't be too hard, it shouldn't be too expensive. But this really is to ignore the rights of internet users, which, contrary to what Fisher says, are very important to ISPs, at least the ones I've worked with. And that's not just a simple question of them having a legal obligation to respect their users' data and to protect it. It's also a question of professional pride. The real hostility of many ISPs to blocking and filtering measures can be explained in part by the fact that they force ISPs to make their product worse, by making the service slower and by making the network more vulnerable. It's not just about money. Uh, Professor Fisher's argument also ignores the fact that different kinds of measures have a very different impact on various fundamental rights. A basic blocking order at the DNS or IP address level may be quite easy to implement for an ISP and relatively harmless to user privacy. But its untargeted blanket approach makes it particularly harmful to freedom of information because it's overbroad and underinclusive. Such a measure blocks all communication to or from a particular service regardless of its legality. Now, Professor Fisser may argue that 90% of the files referenced on the Pirate Bay are infringing and that the other 10% don't matter, but for a start, freedom of information also protects information which right holders don't actually find very interesting or very relevant. And secondly, the right holders demanding uh, any particular measure often represent only a fraction of the supposed 90% and have no standing to demand measures against infringement of IP rights of others. In any case, the European Court is clear in the recent UPC telecouble decision that measures that overblock are simply not allowed. Uh, paragraph 56 of the judgment is quite clear. It says, the measures adopted by the internet service provider must be strictly targeted in the sense that they must serve to bring to an end a third party's infringement of a copyright or related right, but without thereby affecting internet users who are using the provider's service in order to lawfully access information. Failing that, the provider's interference in the freedom of information of those users would be unjustified in the light of the objective pursued. No simple blocking order can possibly pass this test. Moreover, a blocking order is disproportional because it's likely to be ineffective at actually reducing infringement, both uh, because it's under-inclusive and because it's easily circumvented. So the issue of under-blocking is important in this debate because it makes the measure disproportional. During a hearing before the Hague Court in 2012, I demonstrated 10 ways to circumvent an IP and DNS block on the Pirate Bay in about 10 minutes. So, Mr. Visser may say I'm a nerd, but I'm really not, at least not compared to the target audience. Namely, those people who know how to use the Pirate Bay website, a BitTorrent client, and various other bits of software to find, download, reassemble, and view a movie file on a personal computer. People who can't follow simple online instructions on how to circumvent an IP or DNS block can't use an illegal file sharing system and therefore weren't part of the problem to start with. Now, imposing a more targeted and accurate measure might theoretically lessen the freedom of information problem inherent in such an IP or DNS block. But determining whether traffic contains infringing material requires inspecting its contents and filtering out protected content. This immediately makes the measure vastly more invasive, expensive, and technically risky, thereby making the measure a complete non-starter from the perspective of users' privacy and the freedom to conduct a business. And just to, be sure, just to be clear, it's not just about the infringer's privacy, as Professor Visser suggests, it's about the privacy of all users, not just the infringers. The European Court is clear in Scarlet Sabam that imposing a fil copy, copyright filtering obligation on access providers violates both the ISPs and the users' fundamental rights. And again, even, and even this measure would not avoid overbroadness because even if deep packet inspection could be used to determine that a particular copyrighted work is being transferred, this doesn't prove it's infringing. It could be a legal download from a paid service. We wouldn't want to be blocking those now, would we? Uh, it could be a legal backup. It could be a legal private copy. So again, Professor Visser may argue that these are exceptions, but a measure that almost, uh, that quite often gets it right, but sometimes doesn't, still isn't good enough. So there's an inherent conflict here. Uh, between a measure's negative impact on privacy, freedom of information, and the freedom to conduct a business, in the sense that tweaking a measure to reduce its harm to one of these fundamental rights will almost inevitably increase its harm to others. That's not a problem that can be solved simply by defining the most middle-of-the-road compromise measure that's least harmful to each one, which would be a typically Dutch uh, legal response. Well, if they're all a bit damaged, let's find something that doesn't damage them all that much, so we'll, we'll find something reasonable in the middle. 
But um, such a measure is actually quite unlikely to exist, unlikely to be technically feasible, and even more unlikely to actually offer effective protection to IP rights. So where the protection of one fundamental right would require some form of interference with three competing fundamental rights, I think we should accept there are some scenarios in which striking a fair balance means one right simply loses out. And I don't think that would be a fatal blow to the entertainment industry at all, as I'll get to in a bit. There's another reason why it's problematic to reduce the legal test for justifying blocking and filtering measures to reasonableness. And that is that if, in the end, reasonable is the only criterion to determine what measures can and cannot be imposed, the outcome of any individual case becomes completely unpredictable. Any decision awarding or denying a blocking or filtering order, regardless of how the court has arrived at it, can be justified using the gut instinct vocabulary that Professor Visser hands to us. And to be fair, this is not his fault. I think it's an area where European and national legislators have let down both the public and the courts. Article 8.3 of the Copyright Directive simply orders member states to ensure that right holders are in a position to apply for an injunction against intermediaries whose services are used by third parties to infringe a copyright or related right. This provides absolutely no guidance on which kinds of injunctions are appropriate against which kinds of intermediaries, in which kinds of circumstances, and what kinds of limitations are suitable in terms of the duration of the measure, the division of costs, the legal protections against arbitrariness. Most member states have simply copy-pasted this rule into national law, passing the poison chalice onto the national courts. For its part, the European Court has repeatedly held that all fundamental rights were created equal, uh, and that the national judge and national legislator must strike a fair balance. Thanks very much. All the hard choices are being made in individual cases by individual judges. Indeed, the latest trend epitomized by the UPC Telecabal decision is to pass the hard technical choices to the intermediaries and instruct the national courts to invent all sorts of procedural checks to ensure that no fundamental right is left unprotected. So the courts, uh, so the ISP have a right to check their proposed implementation to avoid penalties, and users have a right to challenge the overbroadness of any measure. So the European Court wants to have its cake and eat it, and the intermediaries and the courts are left with the mess in the kitchen. In my view, this, general, uh, this fair balance rule and the complete lack of detail in Article 8.3 of the Copyright Directive fail to meet the basic requirements set out in Article 52 of the EU Charter that restrictions of fundamental rights must be provided for by law. This includes the requirement that they must be precisely worded so as to be foreseeable and contain adequate safeguards against arbitrariness. Judges generally don't have much difficulty enforcing that requirement in vertical situations. For example, when it comes to the European Court and last week, the, the, the Austrian Supreme Court establishing the incompatibility with privacy rights of the data, data retention directive. Or two weeks ago, the UK Supreme Court's decision on the mechanism governing criminal record checks. But this is much harder in horizontal situations, where the restriction of one, one party's fundamental rights serves the protection of another party's fundamental right. And I agree completely with Advocate General Cruz of Villalon, his final observations in the Scarlet Sabam case, where he says that Article 8.3 fails this test, and the difficult, difficult policy choices inherent in these cases should be made by democratic legislatures. To put it simply, a verbatim national implementation of Article 8.3 is not a legal basis, a sufficient legal basis, for any blocking or filtering order. Now, since Professor Visser prevents his case partly in moral terms, let me address that as well. The simplest form of the moral case for ISP uh, filtering is the argument that intermediaries profit from piracy. It's at best a red herring, a bit like saying that car companies profit from bank robberies or the post office profits from powder letters. Access providers provide a content agnostic transport service. Their costs and revenues are the same regardless of whether their customers are, are uh, uploading, or sorry, are downloading a legal or an illegal movie file. They have no interest whatsoever in their customers infringing IP rights. More broadly, different kinds of intermediaries have different business models uh, that are influenced by piracy in different ways. So we have to be a little, we have to avoid blanket statements. And of course, there are those intermediaries whose business model is deliberately facilitating privacy. But they should be tackled directly and, not, and that they are not the ones being targeted with, um, with blocking and filtering claims. Forcing ISPs to block and filter simply because banned sites have to be seen to be banned is a form of gesture politics over the backs of ISPs and their users that is a travesty of reasonableness. There's a broader policy question at stake here, of course. Just how much of a moral obligation do intermediaries have, one might ask, to help the right holders regain the comfortable olig oligopoly power that have allowed them to get rich in their sleep for many decades? <clears throat> 
Fisher's argument here is that legal services must be given a chance to flourish because they can't compete with free. But that's misleading. In, in recent years, I think at least the music industry has shown that you can compete with illegal products by beginning to provide a superior product in terms of immediate availability, quality, security, and user experience. And you do it at a reasonable price, ad-supported or subscription-based. Unauthorized file sharing services, if you can even call them that, generally offer a terrible user experience. They're technically difficult, they have random availability, and every other file is a virus. So the right holders don't even have to offer a particularly great service to be competitive. Most people are prepared to pay a little for a good service, at least enough of them are to stop piracy being an ex 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 existential threat to the industry. Margins may turn out to be a bit lower than those the record companies were used to, but that might just be a consequence of the market more accurately pricing their added value. The movie industry, on the other hand, is still saddling DVD and Blu-ray buys with unskippable anti-piracy propaganda and is failing to allow online service providers to offer a sufficiently wide range of premium content. For much of the best new content, legal services are not competing with free, they're not competing at all. But many of today's young consumers simply don't accept windowing and other forms of artificial market segmentation. They, watch the latest shows, they will watch the latest shows and movies, and it's up to the right holders to make sure they can do so legally. Of course, being, being IP rights, it's the IP right holders' fundamental prerogative to determine their market strategy. But when that strategy consists of starving its, starving its customers of timely access to legal online products, and then trying to force intermediaries to solve the entirely predictable piracy problem which that creates, the moral outrage begins to wear a little thin. Let me conclude. Forcing intermediaries to filter infringing content is, depending on how you do it, either technologically impossible or extraordinarily difficult and expensive, while also threatening the core of privacy and free speech and basic principles of safe network design. The European Court has all but ruled out copyright filters in the Saban decisions, and we should just leave it at that. Forcing intermediaries to block websites is easier, but also ineffective gesturism that has little effect in actually reducing piracy, while educating an entire generation of internet users in the use of encryption, proxies, virtual private networks, and other forms of counter-surveillance technology. Now, I have absolutely nothing against widespread public knowledge of such techniques, uh, but it does lead to an inevitable and vicious arms race between IP enf enforcement demands, circumvention initiatives, and IP enforcement demands against those initiatives. After the court in The Hague had ordered access providers to block access to the Pirate Bay, for example, it found itself having to then ban reverse proxy services that provided access to the Pirate Bay and that had been sent up by high school kids in their tea break. In the process, the court found itself qualifying the Dutch Pirate Party as an internet intermediary, which was, I think, something they were not nearly as serious as that. The entertainment industry then went after websites that provided information on how to circumvent the block. And of course, the next, next step would be to force the providers of all proxy services to block pir uh, Pirate Bay traffic. Then users would move to virtual private network services, and you'd have to impose blocking orders on those, except they don't know what traffic is going through their uh, tunnels, so you'd have to force them to filter traffic, except the traffic, traffic is encrypted, so you'd have to prohibit encryption. You see, this doesn't end well. This escalation is an inexorable, has an inexorable logic and the ineffectiveness of all but the most draconian and dictatorial judicial responses is completely predictable. This undermines respect for copyright, but also for the rule of law. Every blocking order can and will be circumvented. It's not an, an arms race that the entertainment industry can win, at least not without seriously harming both the internet as we know it and its own future prospects. So both blocking and filtering weaken internet infrastructure, damage fundamental rights, and undermine what little respect there remains among the under 40s for copyright. Technically, it's a little bit like building a dike in the middle of the ocean. It's expensive and ineffective, and it messes up the ecosystem. And although the dike can be made marginally more effective by throwing more money at it to make the dike even longer and higher, this damages the ecosystem even more, and at the end of the day, it's still a dike in the middle of the ocean, which is not going to prevent the mass of water from doing what it was going to do anyway. Now, Dutch engineers are an enterprising lot, and they will build you as many dikes as you're prepared to pay for. <laughs> and so, too, entertainment industry lawyers can construct as many legal theories as you pay them to to deputize an ever, -larging, ever larger range of internet intermediaries as unwilling IP sheriffs. It may even sound reasonable at first, but it will lead us nowhere. So blocking and filtering are not the solution to the entertainment industry's problems. They're not even part of the solution. They distract from what is essentially a business model problem, 
They are not effective at solving the piracy problem in the short term and are very much likely to make it worse in the long term. So despite Professor Visser's admirable attempt to make filtering and blocking sound like a reasonable idea, they are legally unsustainable, poor public policy, and ought to be abandoned before they cause serious damage. Thank you. Okay, some quick replies by uh, both our advocates. Yeah, you're, you're not seriously saying that we should not have the freedom of the business of making dikes in the middle of the ocean. That's a fundamental right to uh, our business model of creating dikes everywhere, even in the middle of the ocean. Um, ladies and gentlemen, right holders cannot and should not be have to compete with free. That's the whole idea of copyright. That would mean the abolishment of copyright. And there is no evidence that that's inevitable or desirable. Intermediaries do profit from infringement. In fact, online intermediaries are the broadcasters and the publishers of last century. The only difference is that publishers and broadcasters had to pay for and invest in content. Online intermediaries don't have to do that. They just provide access to information created by other people and invested in by other people, and they make money out of it. It's a smart business model, but in a sense, it's a parasitic business model, and it brings along an obligation to take some kind of responsibility. And indeed, the UPC telecable decision does shift some responsibility to intermediaries to devise technical measures. It does. They, cannot, they can no longer just lean backwards and reject all suggestions of possible measures. There were concrete measures in the telecable decision, but the Court of Justice rightly said, it is also your responsibility to come up with technical solutions. You cannot just say, well, it won't work. It's just a dike in the middle of the ocean. We don't care about it. You have to take some kind of responsibility if you are a commercial intermediary making money in a marketplace. Simple DNS or IP address blocking is a reasonable first step. And the risk of overblocking there is highly exaggerated. It's not as unclear as Mr. Javan suggests. If you call your website the Pirate Bay, or if you look at the Kino.to, you do know that that is entirely based on an illegal business model. And that's for sure that you have to block that. You don't have to litigate for, for that for years. Sophisticated content-based filtering does not necessarily have an intrusive effect, but it might indeed be more complicated, and it might be costly. But how complicated and how costly, the online intermediaries are not going to tell us, obviously. They just are in a phase where they keep that a secret, say, it is very costly, it's very complicated, and we're not going to help you, because as long as we can say that, we can say that any measure is, goes against our freedom to do business. So they're not out there to help, but now, after Telecouple, UBC Telecouple, they probably have to do something. And of course, a general filtering obligation, as asked for in Star Scarlet and Sabam, was obviously too broad. It was very stupid of Sabam to bring those cases. Of course, we were not going to lose them. It was much too broad. It was unreasonable of them. And asking unreasonable things of a court is always a bad idea. And that's what Sabam did. Stupid mistake. A balanced approach is required. The right holders should provide the data and the correct data. And if they do not provide the correct data, they should be liable for that. As for any court order that turns out to be overbroad because the information was not correct. And the intermediaries should do some blocking and filtering of those websites which are clearly bad. And of course circumvention will be tried. That is again the same with terrorism, child pornography and computer viruses. But this whole sea out there of computer viruses Child pornography and terrorism is something that, for some strange reasons, online intermediaries are able to stop quite effectively for the normal, average public. Of course, there is an arms race. There's an arms race everywhere. Life is an arms race. But it does not mean that we have to surrender to anarchy. It should be clear to the general public which generally is willing to respect the law. I was really moved by the fact that after the 10th of April of this year, 
after the European Court of Justice, after litigating for nine years, decided that downloading from an illegal source is actually illegal, the normal press in the Netherlands turned, like we say, as a leaf on a tree and say all of a sudden, well, obviously, of course it's illegal, downloading from an illegal source. Before the 10th of April, you were an idiot. I mean, I've been stalked, stalked by idiots for saying that, uh, that downloading from an illegal source would be illegal. But I'm so happy that we still live in a country where people respect the ultimate, ultimate jurisdiction of the highest court. And after the, the, the ECJ had said that downloading from an illegal source is illegal, in fact, the whole Dutch press all of a sudden agreed. I'm really moved by that. And it's great. That's respect for the rule of law. So it should be clear to the general public, which generally is willing to respect the law, that if a website gets banned by the courts, then something actually happens, that good faith intermediaries do take appropriate action. That means simple DNS IP blocking. And I do agree with, with, Remy, with Mr. Chavon that um, I really don't know what kind of filtering in, in, in for general ISPs would be appropriate, maybe none of it, but at least the blocking and at least the filtering by the bad faith intermediaries is something that has to be seen to be happening. It will never be totally effective. But bad faith intermediaries should be required to filter the places that obviously contain, contain infringing material. You cannot talk about free speech and privacy if you have a separate section of your website, say it, the most recent movies available for free, they're listed here, they get uploaded by other people, we check them for viruses, we check them for pornography, but obviously we do not check them for copyright infringement because we don't care about that. That is bad, that is not respecting the law in any way, and it is reasonable to require some filtering, like was done in the Dutch court order in the Minanova case, and it turned out that they didn't want to do the filtering because filtering meant the loss of the business model because people only came there for the illegal stuff. So as soon as they had to filter out uh, illegal stuff, they didn't have a business model anymore. Not blocking anything when there is a court ban. That shows a total respect of the rule of law, no respect for other people's property, and the acceptance of lawlessness on the internet. So in the end, it all boils down to this. Bad faith intermediaries must do a little bit of filtering. Words are important here because I think the bad faith intermediaries, as Professor Visser calls them, are the infringing sites that he should be banning anyway. So they're not the issue when we're talking about blocking or filtering. They're the ones that have to be taken down. And we're taking down a website or changing it in such a way so that it doesn't infringe copyright anymore is enough. What he's talking about when he's talking about blocking and filtering is that what he calls the good guys, the normal, uh, the ISPs and the normal intermediaries, they should be doing something. So that has nothing to do with bad faith intermediaries. That has to do with the fact that, to, to with what normal intermediaries have to do. And there I think what's very interesting is that it, what it boils down to is symbolism. The, the public must be educated. Now, uh, I'm a sucker for public education as much as Professor Visser is, and I too was moved by the various public reactions to the, to, the, to the illegal downloading discussion. But if general publication is the idea, then let's focus on that. And I think you'll all agree that forcing ISPs to filter is a pretty expensive and roundabout way of going about public, public education. So where the industry is now funding anti-piracy uh, little films that, are, that, that it's uh, hard coding onto DVDs, perhaps there should be some sort of cooperation between various members of the, uh, of the content delivery chain explaining this is illegal, this is legal, this is the legal offering out there. And of course, that presupposes that there is a legal offering out there. As soon as the entertainment industry gets its act together and gives everyone a properly uh, filled legal offering, then the point comes where you start explaining to people, listen, people, sorry, we, you know, we messed up in the past, we didn't actually offer you anything that you wanted, so therefore you were forced to go to all these virus-prone peer-to-peer sites. You don't have to do that anymore. We've now got something legal and attractive. This is where you go. Oh, and by the way, what you were doing before was, was very nasty and copyright infringement, and you shouldn't do that anymore. And I think you'll find that just about all ISPs will agree with that message and will be very happy to promote that message. So if that's what it comes down to, then let's do that. But that just re-emphasizes the fact that filtering and blocking are not the solution. They are gesture politics of the worst kind because they don't solve it. And they don't solve anything at all. Um, I think I'll leave it at that and give the panel a chance to have their say. Thank you. So, two questions for each of you. First, Professor Visser. Um, uh, 
Remy Chavans has argued that the current legal framework in the European Union does not comply with the rule of law. What's your response to that? Um, I would think that Article 8.3 is, uh, is clear enough. Article 8.3 is clear enough in the sense that it says that you can give an injunction, and an injunction uh, is, suggests that you not only have an obligation to take something down, but you also have uh, an, an obligation to, to, to um, keep it off your site as well. So if you're an intermediary and you get an injunction, then you have to make a reasonable effort to keep it off. An injunction is not just doing something and then allow the same thing to happen uh, straight over again. So in my opinion, Article 8.3 and Article 11 of the Enforcement Directive are enough of a legal basis to uh, justify reasonable measures. And obviously it's hard to define, and of course my opponent has me suggesting that it's, it's impossible, but if you're as concrete as a DNS blocking order or a, um, uh, an IP address blocking order, then it's very concrete. It does have to a certain extent a symbolic value, but it also gives an important signal that it is illegal and that the court order is actually being followed. So 8.3 is the basis that suffices. He also argues that the correct way forward is to go after the people you describe as the bad faith intermediaries, the pirate bays, the mega uploads, and so on. He says, shut them down, don't interfere with the people you call the good faith intermediaries. What's your response to that? Well, that, that, is that, that in a sense, that's, that is correct, because that touches on a totally different problem, that is the ability to hide in anonymity and move around. So in the ideal situation, we would be able to shut down the Pirate Bay directly. So in many countries, there has been a court order against the Pirate Bay itself, but the Pirate Bay has been able to move around using false addresses, using uh, aliases and everything. So it's not possible. So I totally agree that that would be ideal situation. But as long as for simple international private law reasons and enforcement problems reasons, we are not able to take them out um, at the root, then there is an obligation for those who provide access to, that, to them to take reasonable measures to limit the access. So I do agree it would be better to go after them uh, individually, but they all hide in anonymity and they hide in other countries, so it's very hard. So this second best option is the option that we have to uh, apply at this moment. Thank you. So, Mr. Chavan, you attacked um, Professor Viss's reliance on reasonableness. You said reasonableness is not a legally useful criterion. But why not? After all, if we look at other fields of law, for example, negligence, reasonableness is, is the foundation of our law. Why should we not apply it here? Well, I'm not arguing for unreasonableness as an alternative. I'm simply saying it doesn't give us, an, it doesn't have enough predictive power uh, for, the, for the intermediaries and for the public, and even and actually for the courts, for something as uh, as technically fraught and and uh, from a policy perspective as as hotly debated. I think the legislator needs to do more to give guidance to both courts and intermediaries. So, I'm, so I can understand how it how, how reasonableness is obviously an important factor in in weighing the various competing balances, but I think there needs to be a much more detailed and granular. Uh, guidance from the legislator to tell us all what should and shouldn't be done. Professor Visser repeatedly made an analogy with child pornography and said, well, the ISPs do in fact block access to child pornography. Why not do the same for uh, uh, illegal uh, 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 file sharing and so forth? What's your response to that? I think the, the, the major difference when it comes to the difference between child pornography and, and, and copyright, not just that there's a lot more copyright material out there than child pornography out there, thankfully, um, but also that uh, in the case of child pornography, there's much greater support from criminal enforcement. And I think what, what the issue that Professor Visser is talking about when people like the Pirate Bay can get away with it by, by hiding is that there is, there's, it's a decision by society that copyright infringement isn't important enough to dedicate proper criminal resources to. Whereas child pornography, there is. So there is an enormous cooperation between criminal uh, enforcement and, and ISPs where the, the, the hard work, the decisions on what is and what isn't legal uh, are not being outsourced to intermediaries, but they're being done by the state as is its responsibility. And in the case of copyright in, uh, enforcement, the state or the states, at least in the EU, have for whatever reason decided that copyright infringement is not worth dedicating resources to. And for that reason, out of pure frustration, the entertainment industry said, well, then let's get the intermediaries to do it. And I don't think that's the fair response. I think they sh if they think that not enough resources are being expended on IP enforcement online, then they should be complaining to the, to the governments and the legislatures that are doing so.
Thank you. Um, we continue with the, third, uh, the first of our three expert witnesses, uh, Niva. Um, thank you. So this has been uh, fascinating. Uh, and I must say, I uh, uh, listen to these brilliant arguments, and I think, and I have a sort of deja vu, as uh, Bernd mentioned, uh, myself and others were writing about uh, intermediate liabilities in the 90s, and it seems like we are recycling some of the arguments that were made then. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it seems that uh, blocking and filtering uh, have a special spin, especially nowadays when we are facing uh, uh, more fundamental challenges, in my opinion, uh, on the net related to the increasing uh, public-private partnership, the uh, uh, existence of surveillance and the concentration of the mar market that requires us to take into account uh, um, you know, uh, some of the, of the arguments that were made traditionally in the context of intermediary liability more seriously and specifically, uh, and I think that this argument has been uh, mentioned, uh, you know, at least uh, uh, implicitly by uh, some of the arguments that we, may, that we heard. Um, I suggest that uh, the main focus that we should have when we look at the system of enforcement by intermediaries through blocking and filtering, uh, the, our main focus should be the democratic deficit. And here I'd like to actually point out uh, 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 three main issues. One is uh, the general shift from a system of uh, prosecution and enforcement to a system of prevention. The second has to do with um, <laughs> Uh, the privatization of the uh, of our enforcement system, and the third point that I'd like to make uh, briefly relates to uh, enforcement by uh, technology, the automated enforcement, the enforcement by the algorithm that is suggested by this type of uh, um, uh, filtering and blocking. So if we uh, uh, focus on the first point, that is the general trends that we see. Uh, and not only in copyright, by the way, it was mentioned uh, uh, correctly that we see that a lot in anti-terrorism and in child pornography is a shift from prosecution to prevention. And that makes a lot of sense in terms of efficiency, right? In prosecution, you need to identify the criminals or the infringers, you need to bring them to court, you need to prove the allegations, you need to win an injunction, and that uh, is really costly and inefficient and exhausting. And uh, at the same time, that guarantees uh, due process and that secures the rights of both parties. Uh, and it also leaves room, and that's especially true in the case of copyright, for the court to exercise some discretion on uh, what should be protected and what should be considered uh, illegal. Uh, in a system of prevention, like filtering and blocking, uh, we only need to uh, pre-identify the dangerous acts or the dangerous materials uh, then to implement it, right, to detect it, either by uh, people or by uh, using an algorithm, and then uh, to prevent them uh, up front. And the main consequence of uh, this shift from uh, prosecution and enforcement and to uh, prevention strategy, it is of course the absence of judicial um, review. Of course, if we have a court order that, yeah, you know, the court is issuing the blocking order or the filtering order, but to um, assume that uh, right order holders can actually provide the correct data and then it will be simply implemented by the uh, ISP or the other intermediaries, I think that is uh, actually naive because we know that the data keep changing. I can just give an example from a recent uh, lawsuit that was not heard yet but or not decided yet uh, that was filled in Israel against an ISP asking and requiring the ISP to block um, you know, some infringing domains. Now, uh, from the time of filling the lawsuit until the time of the hearing, these domains have shifted to other places. So there was an updating of the, uh, of the, of the request. 
And then, in fact, what the filers are asking the court to do is to create a system where the intermediary themselves will update the filters and update the blocking, right, according to the request of the, of the right holders. And if we um, uh, use, of course, a system like this, we end up with something that is very similar to what we have discovered uh, in the um, uh, Snowden revelations, right? So that we have a court, or we have the executive or the right holders in this case go to a court and create a system, get a warrant, right? And the warrant is being used only for prevention and not for prosecution. You never have to use this uh, evidence in court, so they're never being challenged by the other party. And, and again, we don't have any judicial review, and you end up with a, with a, a system that has no uh, uh, safeguards for uh, for due process um, and for um, um, uh, filtering out, you know, the bad decisions, the wrong decisions, uh, avoiding uh, some of the errors. The second point that I'd like to make relates to the privatization of enforcement power, and here. Um, we, uh, we're always concerned with giving uh, the type of discretion to private uh, parties that are actually executing a role that should be secured to the sovereign, to the state, to the executive or, um, a branch that uh, uh, has to act under the, the rule of law. So we have this type of concern when we talk about private pr prison and private police and some countries more tolerate to that others are less. But I think that um, in, the, in the case of intermediaries, we have to really take into account that these are players in that uh, market for content, content that are actually biased because they exercise control not only over access, that is where we ask them to ex exercise this power and block or filter. They also um, exercise a lot of control over content. Some of them are actually publishers of content. If you think of YouTube as an in intermediary, YouTube is actually uh, uh, benefiting from uh, uh, some of the content that is distri it distributes through the content idea, or at least share profits with some of the content providers. So it also uh, when it provides uh, access to content. Amazon is publishing, but also uh, control access to some of the books, right? right? So uh, Apple in, 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 in the App Store, right? So we have a lot of these uh, intermediaries that are both uh, providing access, but at the same time provide content, and in this capacity may compete with, con with, with copyright owners that seek uh, enforcement and are uh, likely um, to be biased. Uh, another point is that uh, intermediaries exercise a lot of control over end users. And this control is gained through the relationship of a consumer-provider relationship, right? I'm, I'm a consumer of, of Amazon, so I will have the Kindle and I will uh, give away a lot of information in my capacity as consumer, but we don't expect you know, the provider of information to use this type of in, in, uh, information that was um, acquired in a particular relationship, the consumer relationship, to use this particular information for the uh, purpose of enforcement. We don't expect in a grocery store that even if it's efficient that traffic violation fines would be enforced. So this is really um, a lot of the boundaries that uh, um, uh, we have in terms of using the information are collapsing when we do this type of privatization of enforcement mechanisms and enforcement power, particularly when we look at intermediaries nowadays that exercise a lot of control not only over the distribution, but also over content and over end users. And this type of convergence uh, uh, suggest that we should actually uh, be concerned about this. Now, the last point uh, relates to the use of um, to the use of uh, um, the you know some of the um, 
um, blocking and filtering and their implementation through uh, an algorithm. And here, uh, again, to assume that uh, copyright infringement is something that is really the easy to implement through an algorithm. Well, we know we a lot of copyright uh, experts sit in this panel. We know that there is a lot of discretion that has to be exercised, and that relates not only to substantial similarity, so maybe you can, uh, you can update the algorithm and make it more uh, uh, accurate in implementing this, but also to the fact that the legality of use may depend on the user and not only on the distributors. The same content could be legally used and could become permissible use depending on the person who is using it. And therefore, when we try to reduce this, these type of considerations related to uh, the legality of copyrighted materials into an algorithm, we inevitably end up with some errors, and that error is uh, not uh, in favor of uh, illegal content necessarily, but uh, could be destructive to the public domain and the rights of all of us trying to use materials legally, to use what we uh, want to access. And, and here, um, again, I'd like to, um, I'd like to me mention some of the uh, Israeli experience that we've accumulated uh, um, and we documented recently in a study that we uh, an empirical study uh, that we, uh, we've uh, done, we're in, still in the process of uh, analyzing some of the materials, where we try to compare the legal system where you have uh, lawsuits that are brought into court uh, uh, related to online infringement and the notice and takedown, which is another, which actually is an example uh, from which we can learn about the danger of uh, using blocking and filtering. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of interesting data that I will not share with you here, but some uh, uh, highlights that are things that could be relevant here, uh, um, you know, I'd like to mention. One is uh, that the system of enforcement by technology in the online environment is robust. And that is something that we need to take into account. And so even if we look at the numbers for like six months that we were um, analyzing, um, I mean, we analyzed like a few years, but if we focus on six months in order to make the comparison between what we see in the notice and take down in the Google Transparency <coughs> Report on the one hand and what we see in the court, so we have about 100 cases uh, related to online infringement in, uh, um, on, um, in, in Israel um, in the context of copyright during those six months. And, it's, uh, and the notice and takedown, we see 2,500 notices. So the removal you know, of materials by this, uh, uh, I think, uh, give us a sense of how robust the notice and takedown is. Who are the players in both uh, um, arenas, uh, we see in the notice and takedown mainly repeat players. So this is like multinational corporation. Do, those are the filers of most of the notices where in the court system we see some diversity uh, and at least 50% are individuals. So we need to take this into account, this shift to this very easy way of um, uh, working through the system. And the last point that is interesting that I like to mention, uh, there are lots of errors, and of course there are lots of errors by courts as well. But what is uh, remarkable about the notice and takedown, the 2,500, more than 2,500 uh, notices in six months uh, related to copyright infringement, but no single counter notice, even though we have documented uh, cases of errors that were made. And so I think that uh, uh, it's really easy to remove, it's really easy to implement, but it's very difficult uh, to create procedures that would correct themselves without any judicial review when you shift to this format of automated enforcement of things that are not being um, reviewed in the way that we think uh, that they should. So just to conclude, um, if, you know, from the perspective of freedom, we always look uh, at power is something that is uh, threatening freedom. And I think that uh, when we look at new ways of enforcing copyright or any <coughs> other right uh, in the online environment, the enforcement challenge is really 
um, is, is huge, actually. It's, uh, and it's becoming more difficult in other areas rather than uh, in copyright. So in some areas, uh, due to the challenge, we may have to move from uh, prosecution to prevention. That is definitely reasonable in the case of life-threatening uh, danger, right? Of like uh, uh, big threats in terms of uh, um, uh, security to, to uh, property uh, um, or to definitely to life. It's, it's unclear whether this uh, shift is really uh, necessary and uh, reasonable in the context of copyright. And, and when we, we think of ways to counterbalance, you know, some of the use of this enforcement mechanism in the context uh, of uh, intermediaries, and taking into account the fact that some intermediaries made it a business to enforce copyright, right? Some are selling this. And again, just look at, I mean, content idea is actually also, in many ways, uh, an enforcement service that is sold, you know, for a fee. And actually, taking into account this phenomena, that enforcement is now becoming a business, we actually have to avoid making it a legal duty to do that, because we want the, at least the market to create alternatives. If, alter, alternatives. If it's not a duty, then we can expect that some intermediaries uh, will uh, not provide this type of enforcement, and maybe some intermediaries will provide procedures that are more just or more transparent and uh, are more consistent with due process. So in order to create this type of, uh, um, um, to allow this type of counterpower and enable competition to work in this area, we should actually avoid a duty to block and filter. Thank you, Niva. Reto. Thank you very much. Bernd, and thank you also very much for inviting me as an expert witness. Also, I must say that I do not feel being the expert in that field. Um, I must confess that I'm happy that I did not have to play the role of the debaters, mm -hmm. simply because it's much easier to navigate somewhere between the rather outspoken opposed positions. As always, some arguments are more convincing, others are less convincing. Having said that, I would like to explain my own view based on six more or less short observations or considerations. The first one is that the scope of liability of internet service providers may be very limited, and obviously it is very limited if we base on the e-commerce directive, but this does of course not mean that there would be no responsibility, legal responsibility, simply for the fact that there is a certain accountability because uh, internet service provider may not entirely ignore what um, he is providing for. The situation reminds me a little bit um, to the railway, um, railway operator's liability in earlier times. You might be aware that this was not established um, for the security of the passengers, but simply for the fact that villages were burned down uh, because the steam engines breathed, breathed um, sparks. Um, and this was very dangerous, so there was a legally constructed liability due to the causality between the business activity on the one hand and the risk, respectively, the damage that could happen without a known attributable uh, default of the railway uh, operator. A similar situation exists with newspaper press with the uh, cascading liability. If the author of an article is not detectable, the liability still goes up um, the cascade up to the uh, editor or the publisher without his own um, or his direct default. So in other words, a legally constructed liability, however we want to call it, secondary liability or whatever you like, um, a legally constructed liability of internet services, service providers is nothing, would not be something uncommon. Second observation. There is no chance uh, of the railway operator to avoid a fire was um, there. There was no chance. Press publishers and also internet service providers at least theoretically have certain possibilities to act. It is clear from the e-commerce uh, directive that they do not have the duty to proactively monitor user activities. 
This is neither the case for host provider, providers related to the uh, foreign contents that they host, nor to the mere access provider. But it's also clear that they have at least certain reactive duties um, to act upon a notification by whomever, we will see that later. If they do not act in such a situation or if they infringe that duty, they um, are themselves um, liable. What is not so clear is the field between, um, this is rather open in particular after the ECJ decision, uh, UPC Telecable Wien. Um, we do not exactly know what are or to what extent, extent exist the duties to take reasonable measures without notification and without monitoring. Um, so I believe there is a certain lack of certainty that we have today, in particular based on this uh, recent decision, and it might call <coughs> for more um, legal regulation de lege ferenda. The third point, um, op the options for internet service providers to take measures are relatively limited. We have heard them um, take down if it's a um, host provider, possibility also stay down, website blocking, disconnecting to what extent ever, and in particular identification of users. Either one of these measures may be appropriate from the perspective of the right holders. However, depending on the circumstances, they um, might be too costly or too burdensome from the perspective of the internet service providers. In my mind, the most severe challenge for the internet service provider, Niva already mentioned that to some extent, is that there is an extremely large, maybe too large margin of discretion um, between conflicting positions namely the justified interest of the right holders to ban uh, illegal user activities on the one hand and justified interests of the users to benefit of freedom of information or other fundamental rights to the full extent on the other hand. It became quite obvious in the Google case, the recent Google case of May of this year, um, uh, regarding the right to be forgotten. Of course, Google is, not, is a search engine, not an internet service provider, but the situation is com comparable. Um, how should Google be in the position to decide this question, whether uh, um, a link should be deleted or not? The duties um, to proactively take measures may be more or less defendable in obvious cases, and I could imagine that this can happen in trademark infringements. Uh, infringements. For instance, the ECJ decision of 2011, L'Oreal eBay, was a relatively clear case, but I have the feeling that in most copyright cases, this is not so easy to decide. Fourth point, to, whatever, to what extent ever uh, internet service providers might be obliged to act uh, um, proactively in obvious cases, these uh, providers still might be wrong in their uh, decisions. This is also what Niva already um, mentioned. Users concerned must be in the position to defend their uh, interests. They also, uh, not only the right holders, they also need easy, effective and cheap legal remedies to defend their um, position. The more we expect the internet service providers uh, to act proactively, the more we need to strengthen such uh, defensive mechanism. Particular, particular, particular uh, need um, uh, for protection in that case, there is a particular need um, um, for protection in that case uh, if the internet service provider has to reveal the identity, identity of the users. In that respect, we have two not um, um, contradicting, but at least uh, complementary uh, case decision. This is the Promusica um, Telefonica of 2008, where the ECJ said that the states are not obliged to establish such um, obligations. But then we have the LSG Tele2 case one year later, when the ECJ said that they also not prohibited to do so. However, um, balancing conflicting fundamental rights. Fifth point, rightly the e-commerce directive to a large extent relies on state, state authorities. Similarly, um, Article 8, uh, Paragraph 3 of the InfoSoc directive says that uh, internet service <coughs> providers have to take measures upon court orders only. 
In fact, like in normal economy, there is no reason why in the internet economy, market players like the internet service providers should assume the responsibility to decide themselves between two conflicting interests involved, right holders and users. In other words, whatever appropriate measures um, may be, right holders should not have a direct claim against internet service providers. Um, in that respect, the ECJ case, Google um, versus Louis Vuitton, might be too far reaching. This is uh, particularly the case where privacy rights are involved. State authorities, uh, authorities must assume the responsibility to protect all higher ranking uh, and conflicting interests, and in particular, um, to protect all fundamental rights. As a matter um, of principle, the interests of the defender the defenders um, seem to be insufficiently reflected in the enforcement directive. And last point, Dirk Fischer said it's all about costs indeed. Um, costs for enforcement of rights may be quite high and also uh, costs um, of uh, measures to be taken by the internet service providers. But such costs, in my mind, should not be paid by the lawful users. Therefore, Internet service providers, if they are um, burdened uh, with such duties to take uh, appropriate measures, they should also be compensated and they should be compensated by the right holders. If this is not the case, the Internet service providers unavoidably, indirectly, will of course charge all users, also the legally acting users. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reto. Uh, our final expert, uh, Fred. So. What strikes me in this discussion uh, is the fact that copyright law in its structure as a statutory you know, property right, if you will, uh, has never recruited the entire world to protect the exclusive rights of copyright owners. That's the structure of absolutely no copyright law in the history of the world that I'm aware of. Instead, copyright law has defined exclusive rights and has said that there is legal remedy against those who violate those rights, direct infringers. And of course, laws have built uh, additional structures, uh, some in common law in the United States, for example, uh, in other countries uh, statutorily, to extend this to certain secondary actors through indirect liability norms and the like. Fine, that is not a statement that every person in the world must rally and expend reasonable efforts to protect the interests of copyright owners. That is not what the law provides. So let's begin with what I believe is undisputed by our two debaters today. Under Article 8.3, under this injunctive authority, which I believe everyone here is uh, invoking as the basis for intermediaries to take reasonable measures, it is agreed the intermediary has violated no legal rights. The intermediary is not an infringer. If the copyright owner could demonstrate under existing copyright law that the intermediary was an infringer under other direct infringement principles or any other legal principles, then of course one might have a debate about what is the appropriate scope of legal remedy, what is a reasonable injunction to apply. In the absence, however, of any violation of any legally defined norm, I think the concept of reasonableness is quite different. Uh, and here, I think the fundamental right to freedom of business really comes to the fore. I was struck by Professor Visser's example of the surveillance camera in the convenience store. Uh, that he suggested, well, no one would object. That's obviously reasonable to pre prevent shoplifting. Uh, well, I thought to myself, now wait. Uh, the context here is somewhat different. First, it's the internet, it's not the corner store. So let's imagine a bookstore because it's a little closer. It is really information that is the heart of what is transmitted through these networks. And then let's imagine under Article 8.3, because that's what we're talking about here, that we were not talking about a bookstore's freedom to itself install a surveillance camera to prevent shoplifting. Let's imagine that every bookstore owner uh, in Europe, since we're talking about Article 8.3, were subject to an injunction from a court that would require them to install surveillance cameras in order to protect the interests not of the shopkeeper, but the interests of the publisher, 
to protect the publisher from shoplifting. Now that is the analogy here, and frankly, I think I, I needn't discuss, it's so obvious, that there are fundamental rights and collateral policy issues that are raised. Now, both for the users here in the bookstore context, those who come into the store to perfectly legally browse and purchase books, I think their interests are involved. And of course, the shopkeeper's interest, it cannot, I think, escape one's notice that for courts to be able to weigh in and tell shopkeepers, oh, you must install surveillance cameras. Is that reasonable? Maybe you need, how many cameras? How expensive a system? Where should the tapes go? Who should be allowed to monitor? All of these are questions that sure one might say, well, well, the court will make something up that is reasonable. I would suggest in the absence of any violation of any legal norm by the shopkeeper, that term has a very different meaning than it would in the contents of a, context of a negligence uh, action or an infringement action. And that's what we're talking about here. Uh, so, I think the issues here are rel relatively straightforward. We need to balance the question of, of effectiveness against the potential harms, uh, collateral damage, if you will, to fundamental rights, the users as well as the business owners. We have to consider proportionality. Uh, does it make sense? Is the cost uh, justified by the benefit? So fine, these are not but those are the issues. In fact, the CJAU has identified those precisely as the issues in cases like Scarlet, Telecobel, Netlog. The question, and here I agree with Mr. Siobhan, the question is who decides? Who is, has the institutional competence to weigh all of these issues and then make a decision in a manner that fairly respects these issues and also provides notice to everyone about what the rules are and what the consequences are for violation. I would submit that it is not the courts. Uh, it seems to me quite evident that the courts are poorly positioned to weigh all of these questions, particularly in the context of an Article 8.3 injunction proceeding. For example, let's consider effectiveness. We've already heard from Mr. Siobhan, and he is, if anything, has understated the technical complexity and burdens involved in a wave of the hand saying, well, do something reasonable to solve the problem of online piracy. Uh, it's quite complex. Consider just, for example, the dynamic nature of the challenge. Everyone here seems to agree that site blocking orders are not effective. They are not going to solve the problem. They are easily circumvented. Uh, Mr. Visser's response is, well, it's better than nothing. Uh, and why not? Uh, I think if you think about this, Mr. Siobhan has already illustrated for us how this leads on a slippery slope to, for example, banning sources of information. Uh, not actual tools, but how does one circumvent written, plain written instructions about inf information? You end up having to, okay, what do you do about that? Do you ban that? Do you block that? Do you filter that? Do you censor that? What about encryption? <laughs> encryption, of course, defeats filtering quite easily. <coughs> HTTPS is a well understood, despite that little heart bleed incident that we had a few months ago, SSL is still a pretty easy thing to implement. And in the post Snowden era, you have seen the use of encryption, the use of virtual private networks is rising rapidly. This, of course, defeats filtering. So what are you going to ban? VPNs? Are you going to require back doors? Are you going to control who may use encryption? These are big questions. These are not questions easily answered in a private litigation context between two parties, particularly where those parties, in the case of internet access providers or online service providers, also have millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of users. And finally, let's imagine you have a world where site blocking were to somehow be effective at staying ahead of the arms race of new sites and proxy sites and all of those things. What do you imagine the pirate enterprises will do in response? It seems to me quite plain, they will move their enterprises into sites that are too big to block. To what I would do, to what anyone who's paying attention would do, 
What you will have accomplished is you will have driven the pirate enterprises onto Twitter, onto Facebook, onto Tumblr, onto Google, onto the sites that no one could possibly say you should block. What do you do then? And on the other side, what other measures might be effective? In the context of an Article 8.3 injunction proceeding, all that you have is an accuser demanding reasonable measures from a defendant. What if the most effective measures are something that the accuser might be able to bring to bear? For example, more and better legitimate alternatives in the marketplace, an issue that Mr. Chavon has well addressed. The court in an Article 8.3 proceeding <coughs> lacks the ability to weigh all the interests and lacks the ability to improvise a complete set of remedies. Uh, and moreover, from the freedom to do business point of view, again, let's return to our shopkeeper with the bookstore and his court-mandated surveillance uh, system. How do, you, how do you run a business if you are under one particular injunctive uh, court uh, remedy and perhaps the store across the street is under a different one. And the store across town perhaps has no injunction running against that store. How do you have a level and sensible market playing field if every potential service provider faces a different injunction from a different court that is coming up with different reasonable measures on the basis of different technical evidence and estimations and judgments about that technical evidence. So I would return then to Mr. Siobhan's suggestion that this really requires something different. It requires a different institutional actor. Uh, and so long if courts are going to accept the invitation wholeheartedly, and I think it is an unfortunate invitation because it is to some extent the, uh, a move by the democratically empowered and legitimate deciders to pass the buck with Article 8.3 to say, you know, this is a hard question. We might make enemies. People might be unhappy. Uh, better than to just shove this all on the courts, say, you know, intermediaries who themselves have violated no law shall be required to take reasonable steps. It's for you to sort out how that works. I think that's an unfortunate move for uh, a democratic system to have uh, engaged. So in the end, again, I think Mr. Savan had the right view when he says the question is not just what is to be done, but the question is who, who is institutionally best positioned to make those decisions. Until we have more of that, until we have more legal clarity, if in fact intermediaries are required to do something, okay, let's amend the law to say that they are infringers. And then let's look at what the remedies ought to be. Until that day happens, I hope the courts will recognize, will refuse the invitation to become legislators. Just because the legislator doesn't want to do his or her job is no reason that the courts should step in and take that role away if you believe that in the end we should have a more due process, more transparency, and clearer rules for doing business that allow business owners to understand what will they have to do, what will be the interference with their business in order to protect the interests of third parties. Right. I have the same question for all three of our expert witnesses. And the question is this. Put yourself in my position. <laughs> you are the judge. You have an application before you by a group of copyright owners. They are seeking an order against a group of online access providers. The order they want is to require the access providers to take the same steps, the same technological measures to block access to the Pirate Bay that the access providers already take to block access to child pornography. Do you grant the order or not? Yes or no? Just yes or no? Just yes or no? No. Probably no. <laughs> 
I'd like to understand what these measures for child porn actually are, because I believe that this is a false stalking horse that has been used by people. It is not the case, to my understanding, that whole site blocking is the normal re, uh, uh, mechanism used by access providers for child porn. Uh, so if I understood what those were, uh, then I would be able to make a much more sensible decision. I think it's, uh, we're a bit behind schedule, but we can go over time a bit, thanks to the artist being robbed. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> what symbolism. Um, the, uh, but I do have one question. I'm, I, I have a rather in passive intermediary role in this. Um, to, to our two uh, primary debaters, I think, who really put the issue brilliantly on the map. Uh, and this is inspired by Fred's question. The question, of course, or one of the questions is, why isn't the ISP either a direct infringer or a contributory infringer? I know the answer technically is, oh, that's what the e-commerce directive set tells us, but shouldn't that be different? And why is cable so much different from ISP? We all know now, teaching the, I've been teaching my students for years that what cable operators do is the, the, the direct infringement of the first kind if they don't license their content. They've been fighting that in the 1980s, but um, they lost. And ISPs don't seem to do any kind of copyright infringement. I would like to hear quick answers from both uh, Remy and uh, Dirk on that. So <clears throat> your, your first question is why there's no direct infringement? Why no direct yeah, infringement? Yeah, or even or contributor. You've been arguing for reasonableness. That's, yeah. That sounds very much like a, a tort uh, law kind of argument. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's just a question of degree. Um, we, we, we work with what we have. So we have Article 8.3, and we try that as a basis for obligations that we think reasonable and effective. Um, I wouldn't have a problem if the, the CGEU all of a sudden decided that uh, access providers are actually communicating to the public in the sense of Article 3 of the, of the Copyright Directive. Fine with me. Uh, but still, you could only require reasonable measures of them. So, of course, as, as, as lawyers, we like to d determine first whether there is direct liability or indirect liability or a tort or some other kind of, 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 of legal obligation. But I must admit that the difference with, with cable operators is, of course, that cable operators in the past, uh, they, they transmitted uh, identified channels. None of them were anonymous. You could also, for, for a court order, for legal, really illegal stuff, you could go after the individual broadcasters. And indeed, uh, ISPs now communicate to the public, if you will, if I use that word, then all of a sudden it's a copyright infringement, information that is clearly infringing. And I have to keep, I would like to stress one more time that um, all illegal content seems to concentrate at certain places. That's not very strange, of course, because the consumers also want to know where to go. So you don't have to block uh, in, in, in these, these complicated cases whether it's is it fair use or something. People only, only download the 100 most recent movies. That's the only thing you've got to block. You don't have to block any parody of or really complicated issues. If you just block the 100 most popular movies, then the business model of the bad guys will be gone. So that's quite easy. So the answer is, I wouldn't mind calling it primary infringement, but even if it was, there would be a, a test of reasonableness for the measures to take against them. And ISPs, um, they simply do make money out of the fact that those rel relatively uh, easily available stuff, which looks like legal, if you go to the Pirate Bay, it looks like it's perfectly legitimate. And people are really misled about the fact that that is both legally and morally wrong. Amy? I think on a slightly more abstract level, the difference between an ISP and a cable provider is that the ISP provides a transport service and the cable provider provides a content service. And being a content service provider implies a much higher degree of responsibility for the content of what you're uh, providing because you're curating it. Um, so I think where, an, where a cable provider is providing an internet access service is just like any other internet access service. And in that context, obviously, they're not uh, communicating to the public. So I think that distinction is, is not just there because it's in the directive, but it's in the directive for a perfectly good reason, which has to do with sort of the level in the, in, in the OZ model where the two uh, operators uh, are working. Uh, 
Okay, um, I think it's high time uh, for our audience to uh, be involved as expert witnesses of uh, uh, their own kind. We have lots of experts in the audience, I saw. Lots of experts, hands being raised. Uh, Jamie Boyle. Uh, yeah, and we do have a microphone there. Thanks very much, Jamie Boyle, Duke Law School. Um, I've been going to debates like this for, I don't know, 20 years. And I have to say, um, this was, I think, the best I've ever been to. So a dazzling display of oratory and of expertise, um, utterly fascinating. And uh, both sides actually convinced me while they were talking um, <laughs> for at least that long. So a question for each side. Um, for Dirk, um, who embodies Dutch reasonableness, and were Dirk to administer things in the United States, I might not even have the concerns that I have. But should you and the side that here you're representing have any slight humility about the fact that all of the prior things that have been suggested as the solution to copyright infringement on the internet would have probably destroyed it? So for example, at the very birth of the World Wide Web, it was strict liability for all concerned. We were all going to be strict liable. And at the time, this was said, this is totally reasonable. Why shouldn't you be? It's, it's after all, it's copyright. It's a strict liability system. The only thing that would have broken is the entire internet. Like, everything that we know would never exist and what we would have is Minitel. And we could run through each of the successive things that were proposed, which at the time were confusing and obscure and people didn't really understand it. It was hard to explain what you were giving up because you hadn't yet experienced it. I now try and tell my students that this was proposed and they laugh at me and they say, that would make Google illegal, as though that was like, that would make the world two dimensional. Right? It's sort of like, it's impossible for them to imagine, but shouldn't that experience make us a little more humble? To, uh, to the, the other side, to, to Mr. Chavan, superb piece of, of work, and perhaps also for our experts. Um, for the last 20 years, I've probably been involved with a group of people poking holes in the solutions that were proposed for copyright. Let me say, it was pretty easy work, because they were so bad. I mean, I mean, it started off with strict liability, but running through, like, let's just break the DNS system. What could go wrong, right? Like, let's, I mean, the, the, the series of, let's allow um, record companies to hack into people's computers and not make them liable for any responsibility. I see no problem there. It was, I mean, it was really, it was almost, I mean, if you could get anyone to listen to you, which was very hard, because the other side was vastly more funded, it was really, really hard. In that entire time, I don't remember the intermediaries coming up with a lot of solutions themselves. I don't remember them saying, these are really dumb and stupid and they would break the internet, but I have an alternative. It's reasonable. Dirk would like that. It's easy to implement, with a couple of exceptions, maybe content ID on YouTube. I don't see alternatives being proposed. So Fred et al. have said, well, make a better business model and provide stuff that's good and easy and reasonably priced. I agree, that's part of the solution. What's your part of the solution? Thank you. Well, Jamie, thank you very much for the question. And um, I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, um, the civil di disobedience that we have seen over the last 20 years, um, I, I often compare that to, to what is squatting in the Netherlands. Squatting when there was not enough housing was obviously civil disobedience. It was forbidden, but everyone understood that it was a right reaction to what's happening. And I totally agree that the, uh, that the right holders should still be, have a high degree of humility. I mean, I absolutely love the book uh, called uh, Appetite for Self-Destruction about the arrogance of the music industry. I think the music industry has learned this lesson by now and now, of course, on, on the right direction with Spotify. I think the movie industry are still making us wait far too long. Uh, and I think that the publishers and e-books haven't a clue where to go at the moment. So there is an enormous de degree of humility required because of the business model still not adapting. And I totally agree that this whole period of, of everything should be available um, is actually, has been necessary in the process. But we have, we, we will we'll move to the point where the studios <coughs> will allow me to see uh, the ne next episode of Game of Thrones just a few seconds after uh, it made available in the US rather than half a year, which is totally ridiculous. But we can imagine that they will see the light pretty soon and that there will be a Spotify for, for movies and there will be a Spotify for ebooks. And if we've reached that point, then even uh, Remy Chavan agrees that if the legal 
if the legal um, uh, possibilities of, of, of getting, uh, getting access to all information for, again, a reasonable price, then we will have to re-educate you young people here that if there is a legal, reasonable uh, offer, that does mean that the free and illegal variety is out of bounds. That it is, in fact, immoral if you have the legal alternative for reasonable price, all relevant and recent information is available, that then the whole other bit is, 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 should be out of bounds. And of course, I totally realize that what has been happening is not good for the reputation of copyright as such. And indeed, uh, it might have, it's probably inevitable. It has been inevitable, but we have reached the point where every reasonable person agrees that what the industry does have to do is provide access readily and cheaply, but they will probably be reached that point within a few years, and it would really be a pity if all people under 40 by then had agreed that copyright should be actually be abolished. Uh, because there's so much, and uh, most uh, older people here over 40 do realize that, that it has a, the copyright is great in itself. Only the way it has been exercised over the last 20 years by the studios has not been so great. So if we've amended that, we should not have thrown away uh, copyright with the bathwater, as we say in Dutch, because that really would have been a pity. But I totally agree with you that we have to, be, the humility is really required. So let me try and be humble as well. Um, I haven't conceived every potential solution out there. I, I don't understand every solution that's been discussed on a, at a sufficient technical level. So I, I will not say that there is no conceivable answer that intermediaries can give to this question. Uh, I, I will say that the answers that have been proposed so far are, as you eloquently say, pretty useless. Um, and that given the iner inherent conflict between the four competing rights, it's going to be pretty difficult to conceive of one that will uh, work. But I think your question also some assumes that there is a solution out there in which the intermediaries are the ones that are doing something. And I'm not sure that's necessarily right. Um, I think we're, we're probably quite, at least uh, Dirk and I, uh, seem to be agreeing that they're certainly not the primary solution. The primary solution is a legal, legal attractive uh, offer, uh, perhaps to be combined with some sort of public education or, the, uh, or going after actual infringers. And I'm open-minded enough to say that I'm willing to consider any solution that seems to be uh, very targeted and very... Uh, very Well, I think we... Yeah, let, let's you know, see what reasonable means. And that means various things which respect all rights. I can't see one at the moment, I have to be honest. And, I, and if, I, if I had come up with one, I'm, I'm sure I would have found a place to put it. I would, really, I would be very interested to hear it. But I think for now, we have to look at the, the options that are on the table and say that the ones that, that, that imply technical measures taken by intermediaries are by far, or not by far, but at least among the worst ones out there. I'm sorry not to be able to help. I, I just want to briefly respond to Professor Boyle's uh, question. I actually disagree. I, I think intermediaries have done an enormous amount and have brought an enormous number of solutions to the table. You have to remember the purpose of copyright is not to defend the margins of any particular incumbent players. The purpose is to encourage creativity. And framed in that way, there's no question in my mind that the intermediaries, the internet intermediaries in particular, have done more to encourage that creativity than anyone else in the ecosystem that I can imagine. Uh, and not always, and in fact, I would say not even predominantly at the expense of the, the margins of incumbents. So for example, you mentioned Content ID in passing. I think Content ID is a fantastic example of a solution created by YouTube, by Google, uh, in order to create a win-win not just for the major music labels and major movie studios, which it has, but also for an enormous set of new creators uh, who are copyright owners too. Their interests are every bit as valid and as important as the interests of the existing large commercial players. So I think actually uh, intermediaries have brought an enormous number of solutions to the table that have grown the pie uh, for lots of different creators in lots of different media. Till Kreutzer. Thank you. I'm Till Kreuzer from iRights in Berlin, and uh, I got one question to Dirk and Remy uh, concerning maybe you can pacify the conflict when you think about what Neely Close uh, talked about yesterday. Um, maybe the solution is um, to um, this follow the money approach. Uh, 
the idea is um, just dry out the sources of income for those illegal sites um, and to address not the ISPs who do not pull direct benefits from, from infringing copyright, but um, 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 for example advertisers and credit card companies which are directly profiting from illegal sites because Mega Upload pays them a lot of money and uh, the uh, consumers of Mega Upload do. So yeah. maybe, maybe this is the solution and we can just abol abolish after 20 years this whole discussion and then we have a fine solution. Yep, I'm all in favor of that. Uh, on behalf of the Dutch Piracy Organization, I tried to, far, uh, to, um, to uh, force the largest bank in the Netherlands, the ING, to provide the data of a person abusing a bank account of a lady of, uh, what was it, 82 years old? 82 years old, which had moved to Suriname and had actually died three years ago, to provide the data of the person who had the right to use that bank account. And the Dutch court ruled that I should have tried other ways. I should have tried to go to the uh, Estonian uh, provider, which is obviously, obviously bad faith. And I should have tried other things, but that uh, the secret of the, um, of the bank account owner in the Netherlands is more important than me going after the money. I mean, so issues like protecting the privacy of an unknown abuser of an 80 year well, a dead woman in Suriname actually, um, is more important than being able to go after the money. So that, it, it might indeed be a solution, but then we should be a little bit, we should downplay the interest of people abusing bank accounts. Uh, you got me wrong. Uh, you do not follow the, the user, but you, um, you, you stop the, the money transfer between those providers of the sites like Mega Upload or something, and the um, credit card company. So the credit card company afterwards is not allowed to do um, financial transaction for these companies anymore. You don't have to do, this doesn't have to do anything with the user, but only with the illegals. It was not about, this was not about the user. The bank account was actually owned by the website. So that was the way the money was channeled in a very old fashioned way, without any bank, uh, without any credit card, without PayPal, just a normal uh, Dutch bank account. But even so, the courts ruled that the privacy of the bank account abuser are more important. So I just illustrate the point that as long, that should be a good way unless we protect the, uh, the, the identity of those people abusing normal payment ways in that way. So I totally agree that it might be a good solution, but there are a lot of problems there as well. Amy, quick answer. I think I agree with the last sentence. I mean, it, it makes sense to go after the money in the sense that it allows you to target the individual infringers and has a lot less collateral damage. Uh, but the, you know, as a slogan, it's great. Uh, the, the detail, the devil is in the detail. Uh, and it, so it's not going to be necessarily going to be possible in any way. But I think the specific example of a credit card company being obliged after, some, after due process not to process payments for a particular infringer is at least targeted. I think that there are issues with that as well in the sense that you know, this, this provider may be doing other things as well, but it's, I think it's certainly more, uh, more specific and therefore worth investigating more than sort of you know, general filters on, on the world. And, and let me just mention, it's about more than just payment processors. Uh, advertising networks, I think, have an important responsibility here. Uh, and Google has been fully supportive and has worked very hard to make sure that advertising money is not going to these sites uh, and have been working with rights holders and with other advertising networks to dry out that source. And I think the good news is today, if you look at many of the rogue sites uh, that are most troubling, uh, you'll see the quality of their ad inventory is not what it once was. Uh, and one, can, one assumes then, as a result, that their margins are not what they once were. Uh, and I think there is real promise in, uh, in that approach. Christina Angelopoulos, I uh, like to give her some extra credit here. She is with the Institute for Information Law and she has been uh, very important in organizing this wonderful panel today. And she's writing a PhD on this subject. Uh -huh. yeah. I am, slowly but surely. Um, so <laughs> first of all, let me thank all of the, uh, our panelists for what has been indeed a very brilliant discussion and debate on this topic. Um, lots of very interesting points made. Um, I do have one question. Um, and uh, it's a question that I've had for quite a while. 
Uh, I'm going to address it to Professor Fischer, since he's the one that uh, brought up the topic, but then I'd also be interested to hear the opinions of the rest of the panelists, if anybody wants to jump in. So, um, Professor Fischer, you mentioned that a notice and takedown is not enough, and that instead we should be moving towards a system of notice and stay down. And um, you say that um, privacy concerns are not enough to inhibit such a system, since there is no right to anonymously infringe copyright, which I think most people would agree with. Um, and then I have to question, however, how we are going to achieve such a system of notice and stay down, presumably through filtering. Um, and you say that filtering should be limited to bad websites, to bad players in the system. Um, and then my question becomes, how are we going to achieve that? How are we going to achieve a situation where we only filter the bad parties and not the good parties? Since filtering, by definition, involves examining the totality of the communications in order to separate the chaff from the grain, in order to identify the bad players and separate them from the good players and take action against them. Uh, you also said that you thought that it was unwise of Sabam to pursue their case uh, against Scarlet and against Net before the CJEU, um, so, uh, and presumably exactly because the filtering measures that they, that they, they were championing were too broad. Um, so um, that's my question. How could we save notice and stay down? How can we achieve a notice and stay down system that protects the privacy of everybody, not just the privacy to anonymously infringe copyright, and that doesn't infringe Article 15 also of the e-commerce directive that Professor Hilty also brought up earlier? So basically, how can we achieve a reasonable system of notice and stay down? Thank you. Well, that was a very good question. Um, as you say, a, a, a general obligation a general obligation to filter out everything uh, by an ISP where there is a, a large amount of legitimate traffic going on and then to filter out the illegal content that would be probably very hard and I really must admit that I don't know of a way to do that in a proportional and effective way. So what I, I, I think in, to that extent uh, Remy is absolutely right that uh, probably a requirement to filter out um, uh, recent titles or um, uh, uh, content with a certain fingerprint or what, what's the, the, the code in it in um, hashtag. a hashtag no, yeah well probably a hashtag or something that can be recognizable so something where the right owners can can provide a list of of titles if it's a uh, pirates of the caribbean part three then it's quite reasonable that if you offer Pirates of the Caribbean Part 3 in a, in a part of your website where it says most recent movies, then it's probably okay to filter it out there. But there's a, I must admit that if we focus the filtering obligations on, on those um, uh, players, which are probably bad players in themselves, uh, it might be quite efficient just to ban them in the first place. So I must admit that the filtering obligation that I find uh, totally effective and, and reasonable only applies to those players which probably are bad players in the first place. So that means that um, if I can get a court order against them, such was possible in the Mininova case in the Netherlands, uh, then it's probably the equivalent of a ban because it is quite reasonable to oblige them to filter, but it probably means that their business mo model will disappear, so they will disappear at the same time. But it is, of course, more reasonable to ask for a filtering obligation than to ban it altogether. That might, it might sound a little bit more reasonable. Then. If it's not, it, not possible to get this, this order, for the instance that the Pirate Bay is, is everywhere but, but not, cannot be, be um, held responsible in court or not effectively, then the next step is that that particular website has to be blocked by the good faith uh, intermediaries. And then, of course, the problem is um, if they would be forced to a m more general network like Twitter or Facebook, then obviously that thing wouldn't work anymore. But probably, and I would like to say that in the response to Fred von Lohmann, the thing is that the, the um, illegal stuff also has to be found by the users. So probably then within Twitter or within Facebook, a separate account would uh, arise uh, with a certain uh, uh, Twitter name or hashtag or whatever, and then it would be possible to prove that in effect, that particular part of Facebook or Twitter would be almost exclusively be used to, to exchange illegal recent films. So after we've established that, we could filter out or block that particular part without blocking all of Twitter or uh, blocking all out of, of, of Facebook. Maybe it's a, an old-fashioned and naive uh, uh, idea, but I still think that if users are able 
to find easily the illegal offers, then the guys who are supposed to, to, to police it are all ab also able to find it, and then there they should either block it or filter out the illegal stuff, which might indeed uh, amount to blocking it at the same time, because then it would be worthless. Okay, we're uh, running out of time. I want to go over time for 15 minutes, but we have a verdict waiting for us, which uh, in the British tradition at least needs and requires explanation. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so uh, we have time for either one more question or two very short questions. Um, Neil has been uh, asking, begging for the floor for a while now. I think you deserve your question. Yeah, uh, Neil Netanyahu from UCLA. Um, so um, I want to push back a bit of, uh, against those of you who propose in reaction to the UPC ruling that uh, it's really the national legislature which is better situated to spell out um, what are reasonable steps that internet service providers should have to take. Um, and I guess my comment is, I mean, there are, there are vast arid stretches of the U.S. Copyright Act um, consisting of efforts by Congress to regulate technologies that are now outmoded as the technology rapidly escapes the effort to regulate them. Um, and I, I just would think this would be exactly the same. Um, so my question, I guess, is, do, first of all, do you agree with that? And secondly, are you really saying that there is no way to, to set out and explain what would be reasonable steps for the ISPs to take, and therefore we need to look at some other solution? Who's the question for? Well, I know uh, Fred uh, but was one of the people that uh, raised this. Maximum situation. one person. OK. Yeah. Fred. Fred, <laughs> quick answer. Well, I'm, I'm not as much of a uh, skeptic about the bulk of our Copyright Act as some. So if you look at the US Copyright Act, what you find is most of the pages are actually legislatively created, industry-specific, relatively detailed provisions that attempt to balance numerous different collateral benefits, pros and cons. I don't think that that's a tragedy. I think that's, for better or for worse, that's the legislative process working uh, as it does. Is it perfect? No. Does it solve all the problems? No. Is it always at risk of being outpaced? Sure. Uh, but that's, I think, better than a circumstance where courts make it up on incomplete evidence with a very short list of potential remedies that only run against one side uh, in an environment where then the guy next door you know, different court, different rule, different injunction. So it's, for me, it's a question of baseline. I think the legislative process is tasked with this, uh, and that is better than an alternative run completely in individual cases on injunctions on parties that have violated no legal norm. Last question, Martin Zenfleben in the back. Martin Zenflem, Free University, Amsterdam. Um, I find it particularly fascinating that we have two things here, fundamental rights on the one hand, as has been um, explained by the opponents, and then also this shift from public to private, as explained by Neva. So I have a question to Neva. Um, in how far do you see fundamental rights as an absolute limit of shifting, I would say, state power or state obligations to private parties. We see a starting point for that already in the UPC Taylor Cable decision, where the court surprisingly, I find, says, well, in implementing those measures, an ISP has to take care of the freedom of expression of the users. And if the users are not content with the way it is implemented by the ISPs, they can bring court proceedings not against the state, but against the ISP. So in a sense, we have a new dimension of fundamental rights regulating relationships between private parties. Is this the right way of doing things? And where do you see the absolute limit of that from your perspective? Nathan. So this is an excellent uh, question. And I think that uh, you need to distinguish between the mice and the elephants here. And I think that it makes a lot of sense to impose these type of obligations on some of the mecha platforms that we, you know, that are owned by multinational corporations and are actually uh, intermediating a lot of the access to, to contents that we see worldwide. And in that context, it makes uh, sense to treat them as sort of essential facility or public utility or whatever. Uh, that uh, has that even though they are uh, private actors, they also are obliged by some uh, 
public duties and have to respect fundamental rights. I don't think that in that case, uh, it would make sense to leave the discretion to them, and, and here I actually agree with Fred that that is something that has to be implemented in, a, in, in any type of regulation uh, that would uh, make it more precise how they should balance and what type of procedures they should follow. But they definitely have to be uh, under such duties, and I think that that should apply both to the um, you know, to some of the voluntary measures that they are implementing. And here, back to uh, Jamie Boyle's the questions, what intermediaries were doing uh, to prevent infringements. I think they've done too much, in my opinion, because I think what we, we see in recent years, especially with the elephants, with the mega platforms, is that they increasingly collaborate with right holders and discriminate, you know, like the large, the mega, you know, like the repeat players in that area in order to enforce copyrights. And I think here, again, public law could actually help because this is a type of, you know, uh, an, an, event, you know an, an example of exercising uh, some of the um, powers that we actually think should be reserved to the state when you limit fundamental rights. With this respect to the mice, I think that the questions should be different, and here we should have some diversity. I'm, I, I stop here, but I just, it, it's, in, and I think in each country we have also, we should enable local ISPs and local uh, uh, startup companies uh, come up with innovative ways of accessing information, and therefore we should be aware of imposing too many duties on these providers because then we are not going to see much of competition. We're running out of time, and uh, we still have the moment that you've all been waiting for. I give the floor to uh, the Honorable Mr. <coughs> Justice Arnold. Thank you, Bent. Well, it certainly has been a privilege listening to the debate this morning, which has been uh, most enlightening. Um, yeah, I think it's necessary at the outset to separate out three strands to this debate. Law, policy, and economics. So far as the law is concerned, many of you will know what I think because I've written at length on the subject in a number of judgments. But to summarize briefly, the starting point, of course, is Article 8.3 of the Enforcement uh, um, Directive, uh, Information Society Directive, and Article 11 of the Enforcement Directive. Now, in the UK, the implementation of Article 8.3 is Section 97A of our Copyright Act 1988, which empowers the High Court to grant an injunction against a service provider where that service provider has actual knowledge of another person using their service to infringe copyright. So in order for the court to have jurisdiction to make a website blocking order, uh, four matters must be established. First, uh, that the respondents are service providers, Secondly, that users and or operators of the website in question infringe the applicant's copyrights, the right owner's uh, copyrights. Uh, thirdly, that users and or operators of the website use the respondent access providers, service providers' services to do that. Uh, and fourthly, that the defendants have uh, actual knowledge of that. Now, as you will know, uh, in a series of decisions, I have held that all four of those questions are to be answered in the affirmative. Um, I think the first question, are these people service providers, is, the answer is obvious. Um, under the legislation, they clearly are service providers. Uh, are users and or the operators of these websites infringing the right owner's copyrights? Well, so far as users are concerned, again, it's usually pretty straightforward. The website operator's position is more complex because of the uh, difficulties caused by the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Union with regard to communication to the public. And those of you who have read my judgments will know that I've spent, spilled an awful lot of ink trying to understand what the Court of Justice uh, has uh, been telling us, uh, most recently in my judgment in the Paramount and Sky case, although that predates Svensson. Uh, and may need to be adjusted in the light of Svensson. But nevertheless, I think the upshot is clear. Someone is infringing. Uh, so that's not too difficult. 
are users and or operators of the websites using the service provider's services to infringe? Well, again, I don't see too much difficulty with that question. I think the answer is fairly clearly yes. Um, lastly, do the service providers have actual knowledge? Well, of course, it depends what you mean by actual knowledge uh, and what it is that they're required to have actual knowledge of. Uh, in my decision, I've held that that requirement was satisfied uh, in circumstances where the copyright owners had gone to quite some lengths to ensure uh, that the service providers were provided with information about the infringing activities of the websites in question. Now, that's the easy bit from my perspective. Jurisdiction is established. The hard bit is whether, given that the court has jurisdiction, it's right to make the order. Now, I think it's very clear now, I'm not sure it was quite so clear when I started out down this road, but it is now very clear that this is a question of proportionality. Now, it being a question of proportionality, different um, views can easily be taken on it. In addressing the question of proportionality in the decisions that I've made, I have thought it absolutely crucial that the nature of the orders that the copyright owners were seeking were very specific and targeted orders, the essence of which, as I indicated earlier in the debate, was to require the service providers to take exactly the same steps to block particular websites uh, that they were already taking to block particular URLs containing child pornography. The way the system works in the United Kingdom is that there is a, n uh, a non-state body called the Internet uh, Watch Foundation. It's a not-for-profit entity, um, but it's not a state body, um, which is has the responsibility of coordinating action against child pornography images on the internet. And they maintain a list of URLs, and they supply the URLs to the service providers, and the service providers all voluntarily block access to those URLs. They were already doing that um, at the time uh, of the first application before me, and have been doing for a little while. So they had the technological measures in place. And what the copyright owners asked for, and what I granted, was orders requiring the same technological measures to be applied uh, to block access to the Pirate Bay news bin, um, and so on and so forth. Now, that is quite important when it comes to the proportionality analysis, because it means the service provider doesn't have to invent any new technical measures. It's the technical measures they already have it means that the cost of implementation for the service provider is very modest. They just add uh, um, uh, URLs to their existing list. Uh, and it also means that while it is true to say, as has been eloquently uh, described, uh, particularly by Remy Chavan earlier this morning, that the efficacy of um, the blocking measures is very, very far from total. On the contrary, I'm fully alive to the fact uh, that these orders are quite easy to circumvent if you know how. Uh, and it is also true to say, uh, as Fred von Lohmann has pointed out, that post Snowden, um, the uh, circumvention measures are becoming ever more widely used by all kinds of people uh, uh, on the internet for other reasons. Uh, nevertheless, um, I think the evidence shows that uh, uh, such orders do have an effect. Um, if people look at my judgment in EMI and Sky, you will see, see some um, evidence quoted uh, about the efficacy of these orders. It, it mainly um, uh, deters the lazy, the less technically sophisticated. Uh, but more, to, more importantly, I think it deters the people who would ordinarily be law-abiding. It reduces temptation. And in um, encouraging people to abide by the law, reducing temptation uh, is often quite a good way forward. Now, 
In terms of the proportionality analysis, the cost solution that I came up with in the first judgment, and I've stuck with ever since, uh, was to say that the copyright owners, the applicants, had to pay the costs of gathering the evidence and making the application to the court, uh, and then the cost of implementation was on the service provider. In terms of due process requirements, um, there's liberty to apply built into the orders for the service providers. They can apply to the court if there's a change of circumstances to get the order changed. And subsequently, we've also built in um, a liberty to apply for users. Users can apply to the court uh, if they're getting in any difficulties as well. So there are due process protections. Uh, I'm not saying that they're perfect. So that is the basic uh, legal position, certainly uh, as it exists in England. Now, m many of you will be aware that um, everything that I've said to you predates the judgment of the Court of Justice in UPC and Telecable. Uh, does that make any difference? Well, that question has yet to be argued before me, and so I can't express a definitive view on it. What I can tell you is what I was expecting, which was that the Court of Justice would say that the answer to question three was no, and the answer to question four was yes. And therefore, I was a little surprised um, when the question to, uh, quest answer to question three was yes, um, which, in, just to explain my shorthand, means that uh, the Court of Justice has said it's okay to put an open-ended obligation on the service provider. Um, but if it's okay to put an open-ended obligation on the service provider, then it would seem to me to follow, although I may be persuaded otherwise, uh, that it must be okay to put, to put a very specific and targeted obligation on the service provider. Um, but we'll see. Uh, turning away from the law, policy. Now, as a serving judge, obviously there's a limit to what I can say about policy. But it seems to me that what I can say is as follows. The starting point has to be, do you believe in copyright or don't you? If you don't believe in copyright, it's easy. Fine. Everything's up for grabs. If you do believe in copyright, the next question is, do you believe in enforcing copyright? What is the point of having copyright if you don't enforce it? If you believe in enforcement of copyright, you then have to ask yourself, how is copyright going to be enforced in this particular context? Now, the legislative solution that has been adopted in Europe is very clear. Uh, as I've said, it's to be found in Article 8.3 of the uh, Information Society Directive, Article 11, the Enforcement Directive. Now, it is true to say that it's a rather limited legislative solution in the sense that it, it does pass the buck to the courts to a large extent, uh, uh, and it is also true to say that um, while it passes the buck to the courts, it's also placing a burden on the intermediaries. Now, that is not, in fact, um, a, an entirely novel solution to these kinds of problems. As I discussed in my judgment in the L'Oreal and eBay case, uh, when referring that case to the Court of Justice, it has its intellectual roots in the German doctrine of Stürerhaftel. Um, and that, it is, that doctrine it is a different model of allocation of risk to the more traditional tort law model of allocation of risk. As um, uh, Niva has rightly pointed out, it's a model based on prevention rather than on cure. But nevertheless, it has a clear intellectual rationale to it uh, and clear intellectual uh, roots. Uh, it does amount, in this context, to placing a duty on utilities, but as Rato has pointed out, there's nothing new about that either. Um, that goes well back into the 19th century in all kinds of different ways. Um, so these are not, in fact, in terms of their intellectual antecedents, novel solutions, albeit that they're, they're being applied in a rather novel context. Now, if you do not think that the legislative model that has been adopted um, 
in Article 8.3 and Article 11 is a very satisfactory one, and you've heard all kinds of good reasons this morning why you might reach that conclusion, you have to ask yourself, well, what alternative legislative model should be adopted? Now, some people have argued, uh, as, for example, Fred has argued um, very persuasively uh, this morning, that the right way forward is to have more detailed legislation and one can see the attractiveness of that solution. Certainly, as a judge, um, my life is made easier for me by more prescriptive legislation. And one can see all kinds of good rule of law arguments in favor of bright line tests, or at least in favor of more prescriptive tests. But one has to ask, is this really a scenario in which detailed prescriptive legislation is feasible? I merely pose the question. If you don't favor a more detailed legislative code, what else are you going to do? Well, as we've also heard discussed this morning, um, particularly uh, the point was raised by uh, Remy Chavan, uh, uh, Another way forward is to say we should have more criminal enforcement of copyright. And this ties in with another of Neva's concerns about whether uh, uh, copyright infringement should be enforced by private actors or by state actors. Now, of course, historically speaking, enforcement of copyright has tended to be a private right of action. Um, in many countries, there are also criminal sanctions for copyright infringement. Uh, and these days, we tend to live in a world where, in most countries, you will have both civil remedies and criminal remedies. And you can have an interesting policy debate as to uh, which is a preferable way forward. Uh, in the United Kingdom, um, the emphasis recently has been shifting slightly more towards the criminal law enforcement model. Uh, we've had set up in the City of London the Intellectual Property uh, Crime Unit, and they have been taking action against uh, file sharing websites uh, in parallel with the steps that have been t recently been taken in the USA against mega upload and, and their like. So that is certainly one way forward. But the question I would pose is, that, is whether that is really a, a, an effective substitute uh, for private uh, enforcement. Uh, if you don't believe in uh, criminal in enforcement, uh, we've also heard about follow the money. Um, but I would question what the legal basis for that is, since that's something I may have to do, adjudicate upon uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, I, I, there's a limit to what I can say about that, but um, I would be interested to know. Um, finally, moving away from policy, we've heard very little this morning about economics. Um, there has been a certain amount of work done on the economics of file sharing. Um, it's still relatively in its infancy, so far as I'm concerned, but I think that's an area where more study um, and more analysis uh, would be a good idea. Thank you. That brings this uh, panel session uh, to an end. Uh, I uh, want to thank uh, our, our wonderful panelists, uh, Niva, Reto, and Fred. More especially, I would like to uh, uh, give a special thanks to our advocates, uh, Dirk and uh, Remy, for uh, framing this uh, issue in such a wonderful and dialectic way. And our very special thanks, of course, to our judge, the uh, Honorable Richard, um, for, take, for being so courageous to actually uh, pronounce a verdict on no facts at all. Um, thank you for the uh, audience for uh, patience. Uh, we now have, uh, for your patience, we have uh, been going over time, but I, th but I think it was very much worth it. I do have one announcement for, before we break. If you have requested special food because of allergies, I don't know if that includes if you're a vegetarian, um, your lunch is kept 
separate in the kitchen. Please ask a member of staff in black. No, sorry, that's not you. A member of staff in black, and they will get it for you. Okay, let's uh, now have our lunch and uh, resume according to the program at 2.30.